Africa and the contemporary Middle East. But she also has her own interest in the Quran and kind of classical and modern Arabic literature. And so today we're going to look at one of those interests, inshallah, in the life of um, a 13th century uh, Maliki scholar, Ibn al Hajj. So, inshallah, Ustad al Banar, Bismillah, you may begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you so much. Um, I am very honored to be invited um, by Sheikh Muhammad Amin to give this talk today at Darul Qasim. Uh, it's really wonderful. So, Jazakumullah khairan and um, welcome to everyone. I, um, I have to give a little background, I guess, before we get into uh, the slides and um, the book. Some of you might know the book. Some of you might find this book new. Um, I was very excited when I found this book and time flies. So I think I found this book about nine or 10 years ago. <laughs> and since then I've been um, looking through it, flipping through it, uh, writing and rewriting in my spare time. And I'm amazed every year that it's been, you know, the time flies and it's been a long time. And the reason I got interested in this book is when I was an undergraduate uh, like many undergraduates, I, you know, thought I'll, uh, I knew what I was doing. I wanted to major in political science. And um, I took one course in Islamic art just to satisfy um, an elective for school. And I said, well, I'll take just the one course and be done with it. Who needs to go uh, on field trips on Sundays during the school year? And um, once I took this course, Introduction to Islamic Art and Architecture, of Cairo, I, you know, transformed my life. <laughs> I fell in love with the material. I started discovering things about my city where I grew up that I've never known before. It also made history come alive to me. So like in school, they used to make us memorize facts and um, it was very dry. I, it, you know, I would memorize things for the exams and then forget them. But once I um, start taking this Islamic art, mm -hmm. Uh, courses, um, you know, change my perspective. For you, I, I know, I'm sure people know Egypt, but this is uh, a map of Egypt in Arabic, since I teach Arabic, <laughs> and I'm from Cairo. Cairo is the capital, and um, and this is where, you know, the most of the Islamic art is found. Of course, there are other places you can go to in Egypt and find other, but like the Mamluks um, ended up, you know, being in Cairo. And Cairo was a huge metropolitan city for uh, many years. It was one of the most important cities in um, in the region. And of course, Muslims were, you know, a great empire. This is a, uh, a view of Cairo from the Tower of Cairo. So this is modern Cairo with lots of high rises. And I've been here in the States since 86. So every time we go back, I'm surprised by the high rises that go there, but look how crowded it is in the back. And um, among those crowded places are uh, lots of treasures. This is a picture of the Nile and keep that in mind because we'll talk about it again when we talk about Ibn al-Hajj and his book. Um, this is downtown Cairo, which is very European in style. And it's not far from, um, you know, the Islamic Cairo where there's medieval, lots of medieval things. And so here is Al-Azhar, which some of you might, or maybe more, all of you have seen pictures of. In Egypt, we say it's the oldest university in the world. Of course, in Morocco, they'll say they have the oldest university in Fas, and in Tunis, they might say they have the oldest university. So we all claim the oldest university is older than Oxford. But be that as it may, this mosque was built by the Fatimids and um, Uman Cairo or Al Qahira was founded as a city and the mosques used to be huge. They're called Masjid Jama and Masjid is a place of prostration. Jama is a place of congregation. So these places were supposed to be huge so they can um, accommodate the whole residents of the city. And usually, of course, at first, uh, it used to be like the soldiers, but then people started converting and the mosques were big to, um, you know, ideally it was to have one mosque, but then what happened is, you know, things started happening and Cairo <clears throat> started growing even back then and becoming more and more crowded. So um, there was a wall that was built at one point and the wall is around a masjid, another huge masjid called Masjid Al-Hakim. <clears throat> and anywhere you look out from, <clears throat> the wall and Masjid al-Hakim, you see 
other, you know, so even the crowdedness of Cairo goes way back because people needed to build houses and build shops. So look at this place, for example, that would be a place where there's the mosque in here, but outside there would be the market because the mosque used to have like the, the market and the palace of the ruler. And then there are shops that um, these places were endowments and the shops would sell things to support the, um, you know, the mosques. And um, so, so I'm all, saying all of this and what, how does this relate to Ibn al-Hajj? It's again, when I was studying all this, I was very fascinated and I started to, you know, know the names of the rulers, but I started to wonder about the life of the common people. And it's like, okay, like there's all this splendor, these buildings were really solidly built that they, you know, uh, survived the test of time. And um, there's one mosque after another, after another in Cairo, and they're all beautiful. And, but how was the common person living? And, you know, there are books like Makrizi and other books, and they usually give interesting information, but I didn't find anything that gave, you know, the life of the common persons, uh, common people. And until I found by accident in our house, <laughs> in our library, we love to col collect books. And I found a four volume book called, um, uh, the full name of it in Arabic is Al Madkhal ila Tanmiyat Al A'mal. So that's just in the name. <laughs> you don't have to remember all of this. Today we're talking about Al Madkhal. So Al Madkhal, I translated it into, um, let's see, I translated it into the way to improving conduct through the betterment of intentions and drawing attention to some innovations and customs that have been embraced to clarify their infamy and abhorrent nature. So this is all <laughs> the name, you know, in medieval times, people used to have like long, long names for their books. So, um, so this book with this, you know, if you think or like listen again to the, to the meaning or to the translation of the, of the title, it's Al-Madkhal, the way, and then to what? To Tanmiyat Al-A'mal B'Tahseen al improving conduct through the betterment of intentions. And of course, we know all that intentions are very important. Niyyah is important in Islam. And up to now, you have to have the right intention to do anything, and otherwise it will not be, you know, it will be fake. It will, you will not be doing a good deed. So when, once I start reading and flipping through this book, I found that it's transporting me back in time to Mamluk Cairo. And it's, you know, for any reader, I would think, and not just for me, it would provide for a panoramic view of the society. And once one starts reading it, you'll find it was a dynamic society that was bustling with life. And, um, and then of course, at the same time, it was not written as an, you know, entertainment or anything. This was a scholar, he was a Maliki scholar. So he was writing this as, um, an advice to the men of his time, and particularly to al ulama, to the scholars. And um, he wanted, you know, if you read through the different, it's a four volume book or two volumes, depending on, you know, which <laughs> edition you will buy. But you will find that he's talking about, you know, people have to pay attention to what's proper, what's hygienic, what's lawful, what's religiously legitimate, as well as how to act in one's daily life, how to deal with one's wife and with the family. So, um, so that's, as a result, you know, the reason I fell in love with this book is uh, I found that this information or the information in this book rather is useful, um, not just, um, you know, to, to us as, you know, lay people and as scholars, but to, to, you know, it could apply to everybody. So like anybody who can read Arabic, it's not translated by the way. So here's a chance for translation and analysis. But I think it would appeal to people who study history, who are in religious studies naturally, but also people in sociology and anthropology and so on. And um, I feel like the ideas in the book, or I believe go beyond, you know, just describing the Muslim society. Um, because I feel that the information of the book has universal applicability. Um, so on the one hand, like, yes, it captures the life in medieval times, but then um, on the other hand, like once one forget that we're talking about medieval time, one would realize that the transformation, the information presented transcends time and place. Um, Ibn al-Hajj deals 
for example, with education and its importance throughout the book. And Dar uh, al-Qasim, you guys are being educated and education is very important. As you know, the Prophet Sallallahu said that one should seek education from you know, the moment they're born to the moment they depart from this world. Um, so he talks, for example, as a mom, uh, I find certain things that will stand out to me. So he, the chapter that deals, deals with, for example, with the education of children, guess what he says? He says, <laughs> like on the one hand, he supports and advocates for, the, um, for education of everybody, of children, of women when they get married, if they already, don't already have an education that the husband should provide for that, for example. But then he criticizes parents for sending their kids to school much too early before they are potty trained. So, <laughs> and the reason is say, so they can take a break and not for the sake of reading the Quran. So again, you know, the niyyah, the intention should always be right. So if you're sending your kid to, um, you know, learn the Quran, it, the kid should already be potty trained so it wouldn't be a burden on, uh, on the teacher. So to me, it sounded very contemporary, especially that, you know, in this day and age, we always are, you know, people are still thinking like when, if a mom is working, is it too early to send their kid to school, <laughs> you know, to preschool and, um, and so on. So, so this is was something that was on someone's mind 700 years ago. Um, so again, like his ideas, yes, kids need to go to school, but they have to be independent and use the bathroom before they, um, they go. Um, he deals with various trades. Um, when he talks about the various trades, again, I find the resonance in what he presents to our modern day experience. For example, he talks about different trades and the marketplace, and I guess we can um, keep looking at these slides here because at one point it will take us to the marketplace in, uh, in Cairo. But this, again, this is just to show you the scale of this mosque. Uh, this is the top of the mosque and it's huge. Um, so when he talks about the trade, uh, about baking, bakery, so he was saying that um, the owner of the bakery should provide water for ablution, but then he, of course, there should be the water for the baking, but then they should not be um, uh, like mixed up just for, um, you know, for cleanliness and for hygiene. So of course, like that is very, <laughs> like that, I read that chapter like nine or 10 years ago and found it amazing. And now during COVID with, you know, all the reminders that we have to sanitize and wash our hands, it, it's amazing that someone 700 years ago was worried also about health and about how, you know, like one should have the right intention and provide the best, um, service to their customer. So, you know, you should wash your hand properly. You should use the right water for baking. Uh, when you bake, you should, I guess at that time, they sold the bread by weight. So if you're, um, um, when you bake it, you bake it fully because otherwise you can cheat in the weight and give, if it's half baked, <laughs> it will be heavier. So, um, so he paid attention to things like that. Um, Another chapter that I found interesting when I first found the book, and I still find it um, very relevant, is the chapter that deals with um, if you're having a child being born, you have to have an agreement with the midwife. And, you know, I thought like that's very, you know, <laughs> close to home with the healthcare system here and how, you know, usually one finds the best providers and make sure that the expenses um, you know, are not too much and overwhelming before uh, they happen. And then, of course, that chapter goes into other details. Uh, but I can, you know, I'll mention lots of things now. Uh, and then when there, it's the question and answer time, feel free to ask questions if there's something of interest to you. Um, okay, so if you were to find this book and start reading it, one has to read it though with a grain of salt, because like a grain of salt, because it's like, you know, I, if I were to publish an article or a book or something, I can call it like the do, you know, Cairo through the do's and don'ts of Ibn al-Hajj, because he's always like telling people, you know, it will sound like the society was really full of bad things that scares him. So of course, when he talks about women, sometimes he's passionate and, you know, or compassionate rather, but sometimes he's also, um, you know, referring to like, well, we know that the women are not the aqlu wa deen, which of course, uh, you know, as a scholar, I will not take that very yeah, um, you know, I was like, why does he have to say that every other, um, time, you know, every other page? But at the same time, um, you know, if one like was to get beyond the negative things that could be seen as negative by us in modern time, um, it's still there's a lot to learn from, and one would realize that 
you know, as they say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, okay, so when he comes to women, so like he talks about different things. He starts, you know, at the beginning because it's a fiqh book um, with, you know, like ablution and prayer and the ulama and, you know, going to the mosque and different other things. But then sometimes he talks about women and then he has chapters that are devoted um, to women. And but when he talks about the in the chapters devoted to women, lots of time it seems that he wants them not to frequent places, not to leave their houses a lot, which in my mind shows that women were you know out and about and um, and doing things so um, like like for their families and and so on. So he um, you know like he uses of course hadith and sunnah and the um, um, like quotes scholars from uh, previous generations to, to, to show that, you know, to, to support his point that, you know, women need to, um, to stay at home and that if women were to stay at home and not go out and mingle and so on, that society would be a better place and all the problems um, will be solved. Um, he in one place says that women should only leave their homes and go out three times in their lifetime. One time when they get married, one time when their parents die so they can go to the janazah, and one time uh, upon their own death. And of course, again, I, as a working woman, you know, whether this is right or wrong, I would find like that, you know, very uh, restrictive. And then I will think about it and say, but wait, like during the time of the prophet, the, were the women that restricted really? You know, what about the, um, uh, you know, in the seerah, there are stories of um, his wives, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like, you know, traveling with him. What about Asma bint Abi Bakr, who, when she was 19, um, you know, helped um, her father, Abu Bakr, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during the Hijrah. So, um, so I feel like, you know, women during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were not really uh, that restricted, and they did go to, you know, to the uh, Ghazawat, and they did help uh, you know, nursing with like a, the wounded and so on. Um, so, but that's, you know, something that could be discussed, um, I'm sure. Um, and then also we have, you know, like what comes to my mind from my earlier education is that women did go to congregational prayers um, because there is, you know, a play, like mentioned that the Prophet وسلم, sometimes would shorten the prayers when he feel when he hears a child crying, so not to keep the mom. Um, in prayer. Uh, what about the Surah Al-Mujadala or Mujadila, where, you know, the, um, there was a person arguing with the Prophet on about, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about, you know, her divorce from her husband. So, like, I feel like women were always um, active and um, were not restricted, but, like, sometimes, like, when people feel there is ill in the society, then the first thing they think of is, like, let's, you know, keep the women away. And these days, we're all away anyway. We're all restricted because of COVID, uh, subhanAllah. But anyway, <laughs> so who was Ibn al-Hajj that we're talking about today? His first name, or, uh, so, sorry, his full name is um, Abdullah, um, Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad um, of the Quraysh clan of Abdiddar al-Fasi by place of origin. Um, it's not exactly known how many years he might have lived in Cairo, but it's clear that it was his home for about uh, 60 years of his adult life. Um, he is thought to have lived over 80 years, and he died in Cairo in, around, uh, in the year 1336. Um, there are certain sheikhs that are mentioned frequently in his book. One of them is a sheikh with the name of Abu Muhammad Abdullah, Ibn Abi Jamra, and he credits him with advising him to write this book, the four volume book. Uh, the work itself, the book was completed, the manuscript was completed in 1332, and it's considered to be the most important of his works. There are several scholars with the name of Ibn al Hajj, so sometimes people confuse like who has, um, you know, which books are by whom. But this one is uh, because there is a rihla, for example, for uh, for an Ibn al Hajj. But it's considered to be another Ibn al Hajj, even though there might have overlapped in time. Um, in the introduction to his book, he makes it clear that he was reluctant to write the book because of the fear that he might be punished based on prophetic traditions, of which a few he quotes. 
to the effect that on the day of judgment, God will punish the scholars who do not apply that which they preached. So since he's talking about the niyat, he's afraid to like talk about the niyat and then do something else. Um, he explains that he decided to go ahead and write the book though in compliance with another prophetic tradition that makes it incumbent upon those with knowledge to pass it on to others. And um, he states three main reasons behind his compiling this work. First, as admonition to himself. Second, in compliance with the tradition that if one has knowledge, he should share it. And last, in the hope that those who read the book and find value in it or in parts of it may make supplication to God on behalf of him, of the author, and that would be of benefit of, for him on the day of judgment. Uh, and then interestingly enough, in the conclusion to the book, he states also in detail how he, once he was done with writing the book, um, or writing the manuscript, he thought to himself, like, what did I do now? I should get rid of it. He handed it over to a friend, asking him to tie it and, uh, and, and that he, like tie it up and tie a stone to it and throw it so it can fall to the bottom of the Nile. But then a year later though, another sheikh who I'm not sure that we know by name, uh, came and asked him about that book. And Ibn al-Hajj then went back to his friend and said, what did you do with my manuscript? Did you throw it out? And he said, sorry, I didn't have time. So the book was saved that way and came down to us. Um, and as I said, you know, like the book really deals with a huge, with a wide range of, um, of topics. But um, before I get more into the book, let me show you a couple of the slides. So this here is the, um, the Madhal, the entryway <laughs> to a mosque that still stands in Cairo from around 13, uh, 1304, I would say. I haven't taught this stuff in a while, so one tends to forget. But like it's from, um, from the time of a ruler called the Nasser Muhammad, who some of you might know, he was one of the early you know, Mamluk, uh, Mamluk rulers who ruled for a long time, for about 40 years. But because he started ruling as a child, he ended up being interrupted in his rule. And uh, so at one point he was deposed, like um, gotten rid of, and uh, uh, maybe he went to, a, you know, like somewhere else outside of Egypt. And then when he came back, he found that the person, uh, the um, al gashin Pir, um, Babers al gashin Pir, who was, took the rule at that time, had built this mosque. And it's a very nice mosque. It's it has a place for Sufis. So Sufism was at the rise at that time. And um, he, one of the things he did, th this is on a very narrow street. So it's very hard to take pictures of. So the, the first picture and this picture are mine. The other is just from a book. But look here, there is the inscription is missing because when Nasser Muhammad came out of, of um, you know, came back from exile, he took off the name of the person who had built that. But Nasser Muhammad has several um, nice, uh, monuments that still stand. So let me take you to a few of them. This is just inscription from a mosque built by a female, like she was the daughter probably of a sultan. And, um, and you know, everything used to be beautiful and embellished. And he talks about that in his book about how, you know, like it's fine to have nice sturdy construction, but one should not also, you know, like spend too much money. But then he was all for having like a private bath for the women in the house so they don't have to go out to, um, to you know to the public bath because at that time you know if people didn't have a bath like shower or bath or whatever in their homes they had to go to the public bath so this is like walking down um, downtown Cairo, uh, down, not downtown Cairo but medieval Cairo rather Al -Muiz. and this would be an example of what they called Sabil Kutab and or what we call nowadays Sabil Kutab uh, combination so down here would be the Sabil so like providing water for for people and upstairs would be the Kutab the madrasa where the children would be sitting reciting the Quran and learning so this is such a construction you know he uh, was th there were so many of them because people build them um, you know to some people think as atonement for you know, <laughs> their, what they did in their life. But um, most of what remains in Cairo are mosques, but then we do have like um, examples of homes and, and, uh, and stores and so on. And this is like um, what they would call in 
Iran caravansaray and Egypt like Wikala. So this would be a place if you were traveling, you would have your horses down and then you would sleep upstairs and there would be places for um, to keep, like um, these were for people who traded, so you'll keep your goods. And um, so Ibn al-Hajj would have, you know, frequented places such as this, but look how narrow the streets would have been. So he is worried, for example, about like women when they go out and walk in these narrow streets, they might be harassed. So he was afraid of harassment. He was afraid of, um, you know, inappropriate things happening in the tiny shops if, you know, women and men were to mingle. Um, I want to show you. Okay, so the, the Ayub, it's built like, like a, a fort, the citadel, and, um, and then later, um, this is from much later, this is from the 19th century, like by Muhammad Ali, but there is a mosque by an Nasser Muhammad on the citadel, and that's it. So Nasser Muhammad is the ruler where, like Ibn al-Hajj, when he was living, um, he would have been the ruler for 40 out of the 60 years he lived in Egypt. And it seems that he, you know, his rule, of course, was during time of, um, like, as I said, Egypt was a, Cairo was a metropolitan city, and um, there was lots of construction, there was the beginning of Sufism, but there was lots of ilm going on, there was lots of knowledge seeking, so probably the different mosques would have, you know, allowed for, like, Malikis, and Shafi'is, and Hanbalis, and, um, and Hanafis, like, all the schools would have had, and he mentions one interesting point, for example, about the schools, he says, like, if, um, the, the, the ulama were getting the ma'loom, which I would say like as a stipend, they would go and frequent the mosque. And then if that was cut for whatever reason, people would go to another mosque. So at that time, I guess the, uh, the endowments used to allow, you know, for students to be paid. And I guess paying people was an incentive to go. But also if people neglected to, you know, pay the students, then students would stop uh, going. And he also criticizes that because like, this is too bad because the mosque will then fall in disrepair. Um, so this is the mosque of Nasser Muhammad and from the 13, like about 1320, 25. And um, this is the inside of it. And there are different styles of mosques in Egypt. But again, they all like this one is not a huge, huge size, but still it would accommodate lots of, uh, of people. It has like an open space in the middle and then it has the, um, the arches where people could pray under. And the mosque had, um, there was no electricity, so they had to have these glass lamps to, to, for light at night, everything, inscription, as you know, Arabic calligraphy was very, very important as an art. And we can see that everywhere we look in the mosque. Um, and there was woodwork and there was marble. And so, so things were very opulent. Um, so um, I guess I can leave um, this here, the slide for now. And let me see what a couple more things we can talk about and then we can open the talk to questions and answers. Um, okay. Okay, so but just to, you know, for people who would be interested in looking at the book after the talk, you'll find that his work was uh, well documented. He quoted the Quran, of course, as evidence in his various chapters. He also quoted the prophetic hadith, and uh, both in direct quotation and paraphrase. He um, like referred to lots of the previous scholars, but particularly, of course, since he was from Morocco and he was a Maliki than to Malik. Um, uh, okay, the chapters of the, of the, uh, in the book are of different lengths. Some are, you know, several pages long, some are just um, paragraphs. And he, um, you know, reading again through the book shows that at that time, of course, that, you know, he died in 1336, so that Islam started, came to Egypt in 640. So Islam gradually has, you know, was spreading, uh, but Christians were still, you know, a big um, portion of the community. And it seems like one of the things he's afraid of too is like lots of intermingling with the Christians lest they, you know, affect, uh, you know, especially like if don't send your kids to be raised by uh, Christian teachers because they might affect them. But again, his fear 
um, you know, shows that there was definitely lots of intermingling uh, still in the community, and there still is in Egypt nowadays. And um, he tells people, for example, to have adab and not go um, relieve themselves in front of, Christ of uh, churches and synagogues. And um, so that's nice. And, and at the same time, he's saying so that they don't come and do the same thing, you know? So, um, so again, you know, that are things that um, worried him, but it reflect, you know, gives us uh, an idea of how the society would have been. He talks about women clothing, about, um, you know, where to live, you know, like one should not live close to the water. He says, al-bahr, um, sukna al-bahr. But I would assume it means like either the River Nile or that even like smaller, you know, waterways. But he has his reasons of why he people should not live close uh, close to um, to the water. So um, maybe I should stop here and then we can get into questions and answers. And this way that would be more beneficial. Um, um. If anyone has any questions and answers among the attendees, feel free to send them in. Um, this uh, is a very large work here. How long does it take for you to get through it all um, as, as part of your studies? Is that enough? Oh, the book, like I've been, as I said, like we, I found this book like about 10 years ago and I can't believe it was 10 years ago. And I start you know, like reading it, reading it. And then I start writing a little bit, but then I, you know, to really write something and publish it, it has to be well researched. So I, you know, it's just something fascinating that I like um, to share with my, uh, anybody who would listen. <laughs> so thank you for listening today. And then my husband, who's more of a historian and he like, he has his PhD in history. He also became interested in Ibn al-Hajj and now he wrote a 20 page uh, paper about the history of Ibn al-Hajj. So, so maybe in the future he can uh, you know, present about that, inshallah. Um, we have a question uh, from Iman okay. al -Yamin. The question is, uh, does he, Ibn al-Hajj, speak about the strata of people, that is the castes in mm -hmm. society? Okay, does he speak about castes in society? Um, well, like yes and no, in the sense that like he's talking about the different, um, you know, the different trades and so on. Um, and, and I guess like life in Cairo probably was much better than life in the countryside. Um, so, um, so like, you know, like, as I said, like for me, it was like he's someone who's not talking about the li life of the rulers, but talking about the life of the, you know, maybe not poor, poor people, but like people, the ulama would have been less wealthy than, than, the, than the rulers. And um, so, so yes, we can get a glimpse of that. But like he talks about the market. So again, for me, like because I grew up in Cairo and because I've been, you know, to medieval Cairo. So like every time he talks about something, I would imagine something like this, you know, so, but um how, you know, the caste, I don't know if we would call it castes in, in uh, you know, in a place like Egypt. Um, like, so like he talks about morality, for example. So he uh, will talk about, you know, like, let's say the water, um, the waterman, when he delivers water to the house, he should cast down his eyes and not look at the women in the house um, and, and so on. So like, and in my mind, you know, having growing up there, I would think like, oh, the women in the house might be like middle class, and then the waterman might be of a, you know, like a poor background. But I don't think he um, necessarily like goes in the, you know, directly into that. But like, of course, you know, as Muslims, we know that there's the sadaqa. So he would, you know, when he talks about the holidays, al ayad um, you know, he will quote the traditional hadith of, you know, like one should, you know, share with the poorer people so they can be happy and so on. So, so I hope that's sort of indirectly answers the question. <laughs> of, um, sure. of the we have three, three more questions. So let's see if we can address sure. them as well. The next one is, uh, what was the biggest bid'ah in his opinion? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> That's a wonderful question. What was the biggest bit? Oh, there's lots of them. <laughs> so um, where should we start? Like he, you know, among the bid'ahs he talks about, and sometimes like, you know, it's funny because he talks about bid'ah, but then, you know, when it comes to men, of course, what he thinks of bid'ah is, is different than when it comes to women. So he does not want the woman, for example, to go out and see the mahmal. So the mahmal, you know, people, I don't know if everybody's aware, but like nowadays we take it for granted that in Saudi Arabia there is the, um, a factory that makes the kiswa for the Kaaba. And uh, for years and years and years and up maybe to the 20th century, the kiswa was made in Egypt and it was sent in Al Mahmal. So Al Mahmal would be like a caravan of camels. And, um, you know, so they'll make it there. And then I guess probably a few months before Hajj, they, there'll be a procession and the Mahmal would start from Cairo, you know, and, and move on and go to Saudi Arabia. With the, with the Hajjaj. And um, so he's like, women should not go out and look because, you know, um, because again, he's always afraid of intermingling. But, but of his Bidazia, he talks about the Mahmal for women. He talks about not to go and visit the tombs. So it's okay for men to go visit the tombs, but not um, for women. Um, what would be another Bidah that he really thought of is like way overboard. Um, you know, that, that, we'll move on to the next question. question then. I'm no, sure. no, but that, yeah. thank you for this question because you know, definitely, if we were to publish something on this book, I should try to uh, <laughs> to to rank rank the bidas and and maybe you know, like if we have a couple of minutes at the end, I'll just read you like the appendix of um, the first volume, and maybe that would give us an insight of what, um, you know, what's the most horrendous bid'ah he would have thought. But, 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 you know, everything he talks about is, you know, is bid'ah. So, um, yeah. Okay, the next question is? The next one is, um, is there, is the book already translated in English? So I suppose they're looking for... No, unfortunately it's not. And the, very little is written about it. So, and I myself, you know, like, for years, I knew, for example, about al Makrizi, who is, is, is a much better known, you know, Mamluk writer, even though he's after him. And I attended the talk like a couple of weeks ago, again by Zoom. Thanks to Zoom, you can attend things in Germany now and stuff. And they were, I realized that even books of Makrizi are not uh, translated. Sometimes people take like bits and pieces of books and translate them. But Ibn al Hajj, we haven't, um, and I'm saying we because I got my husband, you know, in, entangled in this project now. Uh, so he's our Ibn al Hajj. And <laughs> so we have not found any translation. He might have been mentioned in passing in a couple of, um, of sources, but, um, or like paper, short papers or something, but definitely there isn't any translation um, of the whole work. It, it, it would be like a team, it would need a team to, to do this uh, work. And um, yeah. Okay. So inshallah, some of your young scholars might start to embark on that. So all, all the more to learn Arabic. And, uh, <laughs> uh, let's move on. The next question is, um, what are some illuminating wisdoms from Ibn al-Hajj's work mm -hmm. that can be applied to um, the contemporary period, I guess, to the, to the mm -hmm. present? And there's a second part to it. Anything applicable for the young Muslim living in the West? Mm -hmm. Okay, these are all these questions are amazing and wonderful. And what kind of wisdom should be applied to our society? Um, as I said, like for me, like when I just looked at it, it was like, okay, the more, you know, because I feel like I came to the States in 86 and we'll have sheikhs come to the mosque and people would ask them questions. And, um, and it seems like the things that worry us are still, <laughs> or have not been resolved from back then, you know, to now. So, um, so we are humans and, um, and um, you know, so we're always trying to improve ourselves, but like whether you read Ibn al-Hajj, whether you read the, you know, the Al-Ghazali, whether you read anybody, I feel like, um, the, the most important thing is sincerity, you know, like, um, you know, because he's talking about niyat, right? So niyat, intention. So one has to be sincere in their intention. And I guess that's the most important thing. So, um, th you know, that would be a good wisdom to take away from, from this work is that one should work on their inner self and work on their, um, you know, that anything you do, you do with a good, with a good intention. Um, so that I hope that's a good intent, you know, Good yeah. wisdom that we all could yeah, take well. away and apply, inshallah. And and I hope it's applicable because um, 
you know, like in Namal Amalu bin Niyat, we call him Rin Manawa. So, um, so the Prophet said that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and, um, and intentions like they might sound uh, like easy on the surface, but, uh, but for one to, you know, to be sincere. And the good thing, of course, in Islam, Alhamdulillah, is that um, like every year, for example, in the West here, people at the beginning of the new year, they say like, oh, you know, I have this, um, you know, this is my new year resolution and this is what I'll do this year. But Alhamdulillah, like in Islam, you have, a res you can take a resolution every day <laughs> and try to stick to it. So there's always the time to, to renew. And, uh, and, 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 and actually, speaking of that, when I was in fifth grade, um, I had this amazing teacher. And all I remember of him is that he was Mr. Ahmed. But um, so I wish, you know, I knew even his last name, but we just knew him as Mr. Ahmad. He was our, uh, he taught us Islamic studies. And, um, and he said that every night before one goes to bed, um, you know, like after you read like Mu'awadat and all that, you should think back of your day. And, and uh, so that was sort of self, you know, like again, talking about intention and self, uh, like self, to be self accountable. So look back at your day, and we were only in fifth grade, so we're about like nine or 10 years old, and think and say, what did I do today? Did I do everything good? What bad did I do? Did I hurt someone? Did I hurt my friends? Did I hurt my parents? And if you did, say, astaghfirullah, and then in the, make the intention that in the morning you'll go and tell them sorry. You know, so, so that's really good, you know, and, and that's humble, and that also goes with the Prophet's hadith, uh, وسلم, that if two people, you know, uh, get in an argument or a fight or whatever, and each one get mad at the other, you know, when they find each other, they, the best of them is the one who starts with the salam, and that one should not be mad at someone for more than three days and so on. So, um, so if that all shows that one should be above, you know, that one should purify themselves from, from the inside. So if we all to do that, inshallah, we'll all be in better places. So I hope that answers these uh, questions. Yeah, yeah, we have a few more. Um, mm -hmm. The next question is, um, was he influenced by Sufism in his writing? Yes, I would say he must have been influenced by Sufism in his writing, and that's something we have to like investigate more. Um, so he does mention, like, uh, um, okay, first of all, in Nasser, and the reason I showed all these mosques of Nasser and so on, the ruler who ruled for, you know, during the 40 years he lived in the 14th century, he was interested, it seems, in Sufism, and it seems that, so on the one hand, that mosque I showed you where he took off the name of the of, of al Kashim Pir, that was a, could be called the Sufi Khanqa. And he, in his book, say, huh, they call them Khanqa, they shouldn't be called Khanqa, they should be called the Rabat. So, so it shows that, you know, of course, the Mamluks came from, um, um, you know, from non-Arabic speaking where, places, but he, uh, in Asia, but he came from Morocco. So, and in Morocco, you know, like in North Africa, they do call the Sufi places Rabat. So he, and of course the Asima is a Rabat, <laughs> the capital of, of Morocco. So he say like, we should um, refer to the Sufi places as Rabat. And then he has like the adabs of, some of the things is really like, like too involved and one has to like read other things to understand. But he definitely talks about like the adab and the, like the different, kinds of, of Sufis. So there's the Faqir, there is the Marid, and then there is the Sufi. And the Sufi is sort of like the highest person who really like is very close to God and, and so on. So he does, um, I don't know if he belonged to a specific tariqa uh, that, that has to be, you know, studied, but, um, but definitely Sufism, you know, is there. He talks about sama, which is, you know, like involves singing, but then at the same time, he criticizes that because he likes to criticize lots of things that he sees as haram. So he was saying like some of the Sufis would sing, but the singing is haram. And, and then he says why the singing is haram. And then some of the stuff he writes is very cute. So he says, for example, singing should be forbidden. And, you know, and, and, if, um, and, and, and one of the reasons that I found really cute and funny is that he say like, you'll see like a, um, a sheikh, like, a, a, um, like an honorable person sitting down and then the music would play. So they'll start like, you know, tapping their finger, like their fingers and then tapping their toes and then they'll stand up and then they'll start dancing and then they'll start taking their clothes one at a time. <laughs> so in other words, it makes you, you know, get out of the, uh, of being respectful and respectable and so on. So that's why he, um, you know, doesn't like music. But then I guess the Sufis of the time or some of them at least, would have um, incorporated music in their um, in their tariqas, and he he 
be criticized as that. All right, we have uh, four more questions and I'm gonna switch gears here. I'm gonna have uh, Ustad Muhammad Parvez come on uh, and ask his questions. He has a couple. We'll okay, be, sure, sure, sure. We'll change it um, so uh, I get, if it's okay with that, I can ask both together, uh, although they're rather different. One, one at a time, so I can. <laughs> one at a time, okay, fine. So I was thinking more about the, the way you were using Ibn al-Hajj and the pictures you're, you're showing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're talking about something medieval, but then you're, you're, we're using pictures that you've taken you know, in your lifetime. So I was thinking more about how the medieval city and its design, like Cairo, mm -hmm. which is very, you know, um, full of life and designed for human walking, right? So human beings mm -hmm. uh, can offer criticisms about, say, the, the structure of the modern city, city, which is primarily designed for cars. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's an excellent observation. Um, like I, <laughs> having grown in Cairo and then having discovered medieval Cairo during my college years, I um, <laughs> I love clutter and I love small things that are close to human scale. You know, so definitely when I came to America and uh, at first we were living in Seattle and it felt like wow, the streets are too big, everything is too modern, and uh, the cars are everywhere, and they found it very odd that for people to exercise, they drive to go to the gym to exercise. And it's like, why? You know, when you're in Cairo, you can walk, you know, the whole, through the whole city. Cairo is, is very crowded, so it takes forever to drive. But if you walk, actually, Cairo is only like maybe seven miles. Like, of course, not like metropolitan Cairo, but like, the, um, you know, the Cairo, medieval Cairo, plus, you know, some suburbs around it would be like maybe seven, seven miles or something. So, um, so it's, it's very possible to walk and people there are much, you know, like are fit because uh, they, they do walk a lot. So, um, so but in, in medieval cities and like there is Cairo preserved, but then there is Fas and Morocco preserved. Um, and all, all the cities would have like, you know, originally would have walls around them for protection, but then even within the, the inner streets, they would have doors like gates to for protection, you know, so. Um, so, so there was, you know, the, they would close the doors at night and stuff. Um, but, but now we are, you know, like, so I, the, the sad thing for me, you know, about like the modern design and, and, the, and not just the cars, and actually this, some of it is shaped by a lecture I attended in 1986, right before I came to the States by uh, Professor Abu Lourd, who was a, um, a renowned professor of city planning. And she said that, um, you know, the sad thing is places like, not, not just, you know, like Egypt is old, so, you know, but like new places, like let's say Dubai or, you know, Riyadh or whatever, they took the American way of building and because they had the money, so they imported, the, you know, they brought all the architects and so on and had them build their things that do not go with our, um, with our environment. So like, for example, the architecture we were looking at, this is just a spice place, by the way, just for fun, <laughs> because like he would talk about that. But, um, you know, the, these, like the, these old buildings, they, would be, they have high walls, they would have shafts inside for the circulation of the air, so, um, and thick walls. So like in the summer, they're cool. In the winter, they're, uh, they, you know, they, they don't get too cold. And, but with the, with the high rises and so on, you depend on electricity and you depend on air conditioning. So like environment aside, you know, like that they are bad, bad for, the, um, for the environment for BIA, but at the same time, um, like if there is no electricity, all those places will have to be, um, like there'll be ghost towns. So, um, so like the medieval architecture was, um, was built to human scale and also was built for the human. So it was built for the comfort of, you know, of daily life. And so, so that's something that's worth also studying for people who are still looking for majors do. <laughs> that's another, like you can be an architect and, and, and then be interested in Islamic art. And, and it's only not Egypt, but like even India, Pakistan, and uh, Iran and Turkey, they have amazing stuff. And your uh, second question, yeah, very good. Thank you for answering that first one. Um, the second one is more political, I guess. So um, I, I noticed that Ibn al-Hajj is born, rahimullah, just, um, just after the Fatimids and really the start of the Mamluk. So does he provide kind of any political remarks or criticisms in the Madkhal 
maybe against the Fatimids or kind of legitimation of Mamluk rule? Does he do that? Not that I'm aware of. Like I, you know, that's one of the things that attracted me to his book. It's it's more, you know, like it's a religious book, but then it ends up being like a social commentary. Right. Um, right. And um, I didn't see that he was talking about the rulers necessarily. Um, Thank you. Um, question again: uh, Does he talk about the duties of men towards children and their spouses? Mm -hmm. Could you give yes. a couple examples? You. Yeah, duties of the, of men to uh, towards wives and and children. He, he does, and of course we might agree or disagree with him, but um, but, but he certainly does. So he say for example, like again, once a, a person gets married. Uh, he should make sure that his wife, you know, knows, uh, is educated. And by education, he might mean like just to, so she can know her prayers and fasting and so on. But like he, a uh, husband should provide for the education of his, you know, new wife if she's not already educated. Uh, for children, there, there is a chapter um, 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 that talks about like raising uh, the boys. So you should raise him like well and respectful and he, you shouldn't provide for him like a very soft bed so he can grow up to be, you know, <laughs> tough, you know, like not tough, but like, you know, he shouldn't be too mona'am, you know. And for the girls, there is an interesting chapter about marriage. So for example, he criticizes and say, um, and this shows that again, you know, like standards of beauty change from time to time. So he say, um, well, some families when it's Ramadan, they will stop their girls, the teenage, they doesn't say teenage, but like marriageable age girls, which one would assume like in their teens, uh, from fasting because they are afraid they might lose weight. And that's haram, you know, so, <laughs> so um, you know, he thinks everybody should, should fast and pray and, uh, and not, you know, so, um, but then, yeah, so he, and then of the things, like he talks about housework and how the women in Egypt, you know, in his opinion, he doesn't, of course, criticize the women in Morocco, but he says the women in Egypt seem not to work most days of the week. So on Saturday, they take it off because, you know, I guess the Jewish people might take Saturday off and Sunday because the Christians take, you know, Sunday off. And then, you know, so like they work maybe two or three days a week maximum. <laughs> and he he's not in, um, in favor of that, uh, of that either. So, but that, you know, that stuff, like if I were to publish something or if we find a team, you know, to work together and publish something, definitely I would love to get into, you know, what he thinks of as the duties of, of um, husbands or, or fathers towards their wives and children. Okay, very good. We have six more minutes. So let's see if we can get through the next two or three questions. Um, okay, please. If possible. Um, you mentioned many of his criticisms. Mm -hmm. and he must have offered solutions. What were they and how can we apply them? <laughs> That's a wonderful question, but I don't know if he really offers solutions because his solution is to keep the women locked up most <laughs> of the time. <laughs> so the husband should go shopping, you know, if a, a woman needs something from the store. He should not allow her to go. He should go in her place and if he doesn't know how to buy stuff to find someone else who can go um, and do the shopping on, on, on her behalf. So um, yeah, so it seems, you know, I think like that for me, like that's the one thing that stands out that it's, uh, you know, keep, keep the, home, the women at home and then everything will be good in society. But. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, next one. Um, does he talk about how authorities should work toward keeping public places separate for men and women? Like designing uh, buildings or designing the city itself? I would say no, because like since he's giving the advice to the ulama to make sure that the men, you right. know, do, do this and yeah. that. So I don't think he's, he's inviting the authorities and he's just saying that like, you know, so again, it's education. So like have the good intention and educate yourself well and then educate others. And when you do that, then, um, you know, things will be more ideal. So, uh, but not definitely, I don't get a feeling in the book that he's, you know, resorting to authorities to, um, to, to come and interview. Okay, then maybe we'll take one last question. Sure. All right. Um, what are the key teachings one should teach children, in his opinion, especially in their early life? Mm. Little children. Well, well, again, you know, like, um, you know, other than the Quran, like I felt like, of course, the Quran is very important. But if you give me one second, since I said that, 
you know, oh, we, we have time, we'll look through the, 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 volumes, yeah, the volumes I have, yeah. the three of them have um, like Fihris, but, but one of them does not. But um, so here, like the first chapter is like, one should teach that everything you do should be with the, like the right intention. And then um, like the good, like seeking knowledge, um, how to, what to do when you wake up and you wear your clothes. So I'm sure like all that, you know, depends on Prophet's hadith and, and, and the Quran and, and Sunnah, uh, how to cleanse oneself after the bathroom. And I found that chapter particularly very interesting. It's like very long. It's if, you know, more like almost 10 pages. And it talks about the 97 steps when you go to the bathroom. But um, so he was very meticulous about that. And then he talks about wudu, um, like doing a couple of prostration after wudu, going to the mosque, reciting the Quran. Um, it talks about the, uh, the clothing, about um, how the, the, uh, the scholar, the alim, should not sit on an elevated seat because mosques usually had a kursi for the alim to sit on. And here he's saying they shouldn't do that. Uh, one should teach, uh, the alim should teach his family um, rules about, uh, or, you know, adab, like politeness or whatever, like the, the, the rules, the good rules of eating, uh, visiting the sick, um, and then clothing of women, women going out to buy stuff, living by the sea, visiting the tombs. Um, and so this chapter, and that, oh, of, of the things like he wants to say that people should only celebrate Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr and, uh, and Ashura is okay, but that, you know, other things should not be celebrated. So he, I guess at that time, people still woke up for uh, Laylatul Ma'raj and Nusfu Min Sha'ban. Um, so those don't cover um, anything about raising children, but just like the stuff that everybody should do. And I guess by extension, if you're doing that, then your children will be doing that too. Um, in the last volume, he talks about the different uh, trades. So filaha, like uh, farming, which he thinks of, of course, as the highest and best. Uh, uh, farming is, is good because like humans could eat from what you uh, raise, but also birds and, and animals and so on. Um, he talks about the different trades that happened at the time. Um, and then one should have wasiyah qabla safar, so one should, before they travel, should have their will. Their, um, also, when you come back from travel, I found that chapter also very cute. If you come back from travel, and of course at that time there wasn't like, you couldn't call your wife and tell her you're coming, but like when you arrive, don't just burst into your house, go stay in an inn overnight, and then send the message to your wife you're there in case that she needs to, uh, you know, beautify herself and be ready. <laughs> so, so his, you know, relations between uh, the spouses were very important um, to him. And then, um, okay, I'm trying to look quickly. I know our time is running short to see if he says anything extra about raising kids. Um, okay, he actually has a chapter also in Muhasabat and Nafs like you know um so that would be like what our teacher taught us um okay and one last chapter of book to look at before we go okay. so he talks about salat al tarawih and the different kinds of prayers and going to the mat. okay let's check that one it's on page 97 and see if it will give us anything important. Um, okay, we're here. Okay, so here is saying that a person should study at home um, better, but then also they can go to school, to the mosque. Um, but if you're in the mosque, you have to, you know, behave, of course, we like follow the adab, and um, okay. okay, and then he's talking about like the um, how like when you teach as a teacher that you get the thawab, inshallah, um, 
And then he quotes here in say, قَالَ تَعَالَى سَأَصْرِفْ عَنْ آيَاتِ الَّذِينَ يَتَكَبَّرُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ And so he says some people um, memorize the Qur'an, but then they will not get the benefit of it because they don't understand it and they don't apply it. And that's what's actually required when you uh, memorize the Qur'an. Um, well, we're at the end of the hour. So we'll have to stop at that, but, um, but yeah. please urge people to look. It's very at nice, very enlightening, very informative. Thank you so much for giving from your time. Uh, Ustad uh, Muhammad Farvez, do you want to add a few? No, just, just say thank you. And yeah, I, I think we're all uh, looking forward to exploring this text ourselves if we can. Inshallah, Jazakallah khair. Our interest. <laughs> okay, good, good night and salam to everyone. Inshallah, salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Thank you all for attending and thank you again, Ustad Amuna. Alhamdulillah, thank you so much. Salam alaikum. Alaikum, salam wa rahmatullah.